it's time for another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas, the podcast covering the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life in general here in the Ozarks. Whether you are considering a move to this area or trying to learn more about the place you call home, we've got something special for you. Here's our host, Randy Wilburn. Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and I'm excited to be with you today. It's it's one thing that I'm doing right now that I've promised my listeners is that I'm going to be really active to get out there and get ahead of events that are happening so that we can highlight and promote those events. And today, I actually get to sit down with uh, another guest that I've had on the show. I get to sit down with his beautiful wife. And uh, Laura Kellums is the Northwest Arkansas Director of Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families, AACF. And I know that is a mouthful, but it's because they do a lot of great things here in this state. And so without further ado, Laura, it is so great to have you on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I got it. I want to tell the audience, I mean, when I read about their Soup Sunday program, which if you haven't heard about it, they are doing a program at the John Q. Hammonds Center in Rogers, Arkansas, which is right up there basically where the Embassy Suites is right off of 49. They're doing a uh, Soup Sunday program from 4 to 6.30 p.m. on January 26, 2020. If you're listening to this podcast episode after that, trust me, I've eaten all of the soup. So there will be some for you next year. But uh, I, I want to encourage you to come out. There's still opportunities for sponsorships. Some of the finest restaurants in the area are participating in this. And I'm not going to steal Laura's thunder. I'll let her tell us a little bit more about the event. But I'm just excited about it because it is for a good cause and it benefits Arkansas advocates for children and families. So we certainly want to encourage you to be a part of that. It's again, January 26, 2020, from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the John Q. Hammonds in uh, Rogers, Arkansas. And uh, any questions or information, I'll give you all of that. It'll be in the show notes. You can check it out. But without further ado, Laura, how are you doing? Great. Good, I'm good. so glad. I'm so glad that uh, I can be part of your podcast. Yeah, no, I am too. I mean, it, it's if this, this will be, this will mark, and I'll have to mark this down. This will be the first time I've actually had a husband and a wife on talking about two different things. And again, Laura is the uh, the wife of Kyle Kellums, who is part of KUAF. And he was on a previous episode of this podcast. And Kyle's just a great guy. And he joked with me when I asked him about Laura and whether she'd be able to come on the podcast was, you know, he said, well, you know, certainly you won't be at a loss for words. And it's just because he and I don't are certainly are never at a loss for words. So that's great. But why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and give us your superhero origin story and how do we find you here now as the Northwest Arkansas Director of sure. AACF? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I moved to Fayetteville to go to college okay. and, and never left okay. in 1990. And it, uh, Fayetteville has, or Northwest Arkansas has its way of doing that, right? You get out of school and the economy has always been good. And so it was a good opportunity to just stay. But my, what I originally worked in was journalism. Yeah, and I so that. I was a newspaper reporter for 15 years and I loved that job. And I covered, mostly covered local and state politics. So okay. I covered local governments for the newspapers and I ended up most of, spending most of that time covering state government for the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. And so I would go and cover the state legislature and learned a lot about how the legislative process works. And I learned a lot about public policy and what's good public policy and what's not so great <laughs> public policy. And uh, one of the things I noticed when I was a reporter was that there weren't that many, like, quote, regular folks right. who were at the Capitol, who were engaged in that process. And one organization that I saw that kind of filled some of that role was Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families. Okay. And so it's an organization that's been around since 1977. And it ha works to change public policy in ways that can really help children and families thrive. So, and, you know, examples could be a good pre-K program or a children's health insurance program. And we can talk more about that. But I saw that, the, you know, there were just a handful of organizations and people who were part of that policy process at the state legislature when I was observing it as a reporter. 
And even at that time, I, I remember thinking, you know, that would be a really cool way to spend your life and, you know, make a difference would be to represent regular folks at the Capitol and then that process. And so when Arkansas Advocates decided to open an office in Northwest Arkansas in 2008, I jumped at the chance to totally switch careers and do something completely different. Although it's still public policy and I was sort of watching public policy, it's a whole new thing to actually be an advocate for for change as opposed to just being an observer. But I found that I think that's really my niche, that uh, not just watching other people try to make a difference in the community, but really trying to jump in and do that myself as well. And so I was really glad that Advocates was willing to take a leap of faith on someone who hadn't worked in the nonprofit community and hadn't been an advocate, but just knew the public policy process. And so they were willing. And I opened this office in 2008 by myself. I mean, obviously, I had a lot of support, but I was the only employee for a long time. And now we have another full-time employee here who works with me, Missy Kincaid, and a part-time person too, So, and an intern. (laughs) So gone from one to four, and we're real happy about that. Now, how big is the the main office down in Little Rock? Um, we have 13 full-time staff members down there, okay. and then we have the staff members here. Is there a, any other satellite offices in the state besides? Nope, no. just uh, Northwest Arkansas and Little Rock. And we were the first ever satellite office, and the, you know, the organization was more than 30 years old at the time. But they really recognize that if you want to make a difference in public policy in Arkansas, you need to have a strong voice here yeah. in Northwest Arkansas because- the, you know, the increasingly the political clout from this region is, you know, driving a lot of statewide policy. And so we need to have a lot of influence here to have influence statewide. If you yeah. think about, you know, the governors from here, you know, the a bunch of the folks who make the big decisions in Little Rock are from here. The head of the state Senate is from Benton County. And so we need to make sure that we have strong relationships with those folks So when we go talk to them about, hey, here's something that is a good idea that would really help kids in our state, that they have a relationship with us already. And also, we want to make sure that people who live in Northwest Arkansas know about these important issues, and then they can talk to their lawmakers and to the governor and, you know, folks who um, might be their constituents up here. We want to make sure that they're hearing the same messages that we're trying to put out statewide. Yeah, absolutely. And it gives new meaning to having skin in the game because, you know, you got people here that represent you. So how do you, I mean, and I just, this is kind of off topic, but how do you guys get down to like reach like the Delta region and other parts of the state, which are a lot different sure. than Northwest Arkansas. Yeah, we have really strong partners. I mean, we do we do have um, statewide outreach, so we um, engage communities in the as much as we can with our size and capacity. But we have really strong partners, including the Arkansas Public Policy Panel, okay. Citizens First Congress. I don't know if you've heard of that organization, but they do a lot of grassroots on the ground work, not only with trying to influence state government, but trying to get folks to engage in their local governments and make sure that that people who have been disenfranchised for a long time or who haven't been part of that process, whose the, their voices are included, not only at the local level and regional delta level, but at the state level too. And so we that's their strong suit. And so oftentimes we work closely in partnership with them just to make sure that we're hearing that voice. Another cool thing we do is go directly into as many communities as we can get to in the state, whether we have an office there or not. But we go into the communities and have what we call policy roundtables and Mm -hmm. uh, or even sometimes we call them policy cafes. And uh, we get folks from a community together around tables and, you know, just depends on how many people can come and we hear from them. So, you know, one way to do our work is to tell people, hey, this is an important policy stance that we think people should take. But then at least as important as that, is hearing from people in the community and saying, what should we be working on? What are we missing? What are the challenges that kids and families in our state are facing that we need to tackle? And so we go into communities to hear from people, not only here in Northwest Arkansas and Little Rock, but all around the state. So... Yeah, that that's really interesting. And when I th- and when I look at where your location is, and for those that, that are familiar with this area, you're right down the street from the Jones Center, right here on Emma. If you keep going down Emma a little bit further, you kind of hit the middle of the downtown corridor for Springdale, which is kind of revitalized and taken on a new turn. You've got Tyson that has a location. You've got 
Apple Blossom. Um, you've got uh, a bunch of different breweries that are right here. They're and about so, to build a new hauler, the, like a Springdale version exactly, of the hauler. Right? Yeah, which right. is going to be nice. It'll be yes. nice. I don't have to drive all the way to Bentonville. Yeah. Although I don't <laughs> mind going up to the A Street Market, right. but uh, that is going to be nice. I mean, we keep seeing this revitalization, but I was saying all that to say that we're also right in the backyard of a very large community that only exists in Northwest Arkansas. That's I'm right. speaking of the Marshallese community. And it's, you know, I was explaining to somebody that, that, that isn't from here. I was like, yeah, well, we have a, you know, a large group of folks that are from the Marshall Islands and people are like, what, the Marshall Islands? What, where is that? So I have to start, you know, educating people about it and about all, all the testing that we did over there as a country back in the day and how, you know, most of the displaced people that are not, that are from the Marshall Islands are based in this area. Just like a lot of people from Somalia went to two places here in the United States, refugees, they went to Minnesota and they went to Maine. And that's why you have a large population of Somalis in those two specific areas. But could you talk just a little bit about how you do you guys work with the Marshallese community at all? Yes. Yeah. This is one of the best examples of having strong community partnerships is really the only way we can do our work. We don't do direct services to families. We only work on public policy solutions. And so when we to know what's going on in the community, we have to have these strong partnerships with, you know, folks like I mentioned, the public policy panel and others who are working directly with families. And so when Arkansas Coalition of Marshallese is a is one of our partners and also another organization called Marshallese Educational Initiative, we make sure that we're in close contact all the time. I and mean, they're actually in the same building as us right? Yeah. With, with some of these organizations to make sure we're hearing what they're hearing. Another example would be there are folks in this building, who, the community clinic and others who help children get insurance and they sometimes will highlight bureaucratic barriers that are causing problems for children and families. And so we hear that. But uh, so for years, even when I was a reporter, we had, I had learned more and more about the health issues in the Marshallese community and not only just like health issues that were caused by some of our own, our own government's work in the Marshall Islands with nuclear testing, but also just with access to care here in the United States. And that access to care was really caused, the trouble that they have with access to care was really caused by inadvertent changes in federal and state law, accidental, basically typos, like in the Welfare Reform Act that was passed in 1996. They just wrote the version of someone who would be lawfully living in the United States. They just wrote it too narrowly to include Marshallese people who are lawfully living in the United States States, because of the compact. And so there are things like that that we started to notice in the federal law and in the way the state was interpreting it, that were unnecessarily keeping kids out of the doctor's office. And so we helped in 2017 pass a new state policy that allowed children from them who were born in the Marshall Islands to have to have access to our kids first, which is the Children's Health Insurance Program in Arkansas. So that's probably our best example of, you know, looking at Northwest Arkansas community partnerships and communities that li- like the Marshallese who live here, but mostly don't live in the rest of the state. And because we have those strong partnerships, we can be, we can know what the challenges that children face. And we can also use our public policy expertise to say, you know what, all we need to do is this one little change. Mm-hmm. And we asked, you know, we went through two governorships trying to get that change made. And we finally got it in 2017 and families were able to, in 2018, for the first time, sign up for, for Our Kids First, thanks to Governor Hutchinson, making that a priority to change that. And a Springdale lawmaker who also understood the uniqueness of the right. population here. So that's what, I mean, one reason why we need this office here for Arkansas advocates is we, we saw the changes coming down at the, at the federal level. And we said, you know, if Marshallese kids aren't kids who are eligible for this program, then nobody is. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so let's fix exactly. it. And so we did. So that, that's one of the examples. And this is where I should probably mention that our work is we want all kids and families in, in the state to thrive and to meet their full potential and have the economic opportunity that they need to succeed. But our work is very focused on low income kids and families and kids in poverty and their families, because statistics show that the type of opportunities that I may have had growing up might not be available to children whose families live at, at or under or near the poverty level. And so, if, so we, what we do is look at what are those opportunities that we could be providing to kids, everything from, like I mentioned, early childhood programs to after school programs, mentorship programs, access to the doctor. What are the things that help 
make sure that kids stay healthy and, and um, learning and succeed, are there things that we can do as a state? And so we've had a lot of big accomplishments over the years. And that includes, you know, changes in the juvenile justice system and the foster care system. And even in our own state tax policy, a lot, a lot of people don't understand that lower income people pay a much bigger percentage of their income in taxes than higher income people. And so sometimes we look at changes to the tax, state tax policy as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I'd be curious to know what, I mean, what's on your radar now? I mean, what do you, I mean, it seems like you've gotten a lot done and you've been in this role for like 12 years now. Mm-hmm. I'm sure time has flown for you, yeah. <laughs> but, but what are you doing now? What are you seeing as like the next step for your organization? We, right now, one of the big things that we have that's really timely going on is the census, the 2020 census. So we're, children actually are the most likely age group to be undercounted in the census. Families literally just, you know, sometimes don't recognize that they need to have the kids counted on their census or they maybe kids are living with grandparents or in some other complex kind of family situation and they aren't counted. And so what we're trying to do is get the word out to parents, early childhood providers, others to make sure that everybody understands what that it's the census is happening and why they why it's important. And one of the big reasons that we're reminding people why it's important is federal programs often are really directed by census numbers or at least influenced by census numbers. So everything from our highway funding in Arkansas to, you know, the number of school buses that a school district can buy to um, special federal funding that might come to schools based on population. We want to make sure that every child and every adult is counted in across the state. And so we're really concentrating on that in Northwest Arkansas. And that's one one reason why those close partnerships with like the Marshallese and with other immigrant rights organizations are, are really helping to make sure that we and they can help get the word out about the census. So that's one big one. And then we're always working, as I mentioned, to try to improve tax policy in the state. And one thing that we really want to get done is an earned income tax credit okay. at the state level. There's a federal earned income tax credit that is a targeted tax credit to low-income people, and most states have their own, but it, which helps kind of mitigate that unfairness factor in the tax policy, but Arkansas doesn't have one, so we'll continue, continue working on that. We got that an earned income tax credit passed out of the state Senate in the last legislative session, but it didn't pass in the House, and so we'll continue to work on that. And we're always, you know, we, we helped expand the state's pre-K program. But we aren't serving the, as many kids as needed. So it's called the Arkansas Better Chance Program, and it is targeted to three and four year olds who are low income. And we're not serving even all of those kids, let alone all the other kids in the state who need it. Right. Wow. Those are just a few examples. I'll give you one more quick one that juvenile justice reform. Yep. One of the really cool things that the legislature and Governor Hutchinson did last year. Yeah, last year. It's 2020 now. Last year in the 2019 19 session was change the way that we spend juvenile justice money and they we want to incarcerate fewer kids who aren't a safety risk to their communities. If they're not like an imminent safety risk, they don't need to be going down to a state prison right. for kids, basically. Sure. What we need is more local community programs. And so the the government made a made a priority to spend less on incarceration and more on community programs. And so we're going to be kind of monitoring that to make sure it works the way it's supposed to. You know, we, one of the things we do at Advocates is, you know, we talk a lot about kind of new programs or new services that families might need. But another, maybe at least as important thing that we do is make sure that the state is doing a good job with what exists today. And, you know, juvenile justice is a good example of that because it's cheaper and more effective to spend money on community programs. But often we don't do what's cheaper and more effective. And so we we don't necessarily need to spend more. We need to spend better and we need to make sure that kids are a priority. And so that's why we never, never are satisfied. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and why and why spend money on prison beds when you can reach a kid before they even get there and, right. and change their lives. So. Right. And, you know, we all know that once a, once somebody is in prison, you know, the chances of them having a total rehabilitation is a lot less than it's if they have different. a service in their community. And so Washington and Benton counties actually have been real leaders in doing that already. They were ahead of the state. So our juvenile courts here were already doing that. So one one thing we did was just show the rest of the state that it works here in Northwest Arkansas and that we actually send fewer kids to prison, kid prison, than we used to. And that, you know, we're st- we still have safe communities. This can be done. And so we wanted to show the rest of the state that they can do that too. 
Listen, the communities here, and just for perspective, are really safe. It's like I, I tell people all the time, and everybody that's listened to this podcast for more than once knows that I, rich, I came here from Boston, 17 years in Boston, and my wife happens to be there right now. And it was so funny. We were talking on the phone yesterday, and I'm like, I could hear in the background, like police siren going off or whatever. People are doing something. I'm like, you know where you never hear police sirens? In Northwest Arkansas. And I mean, of course, every now and then you do, but it's more of an event than it's like an everyday occurrence. Right. And so people have to recognize that, you know, this is a pretty safe place to be and that it's, you know, you go to some bigger cities, it will give you a quick perspective on how life is. And so, and how the other half lives, if you will, in other parts of the country. So. And I mean, one thing we know is that a lot of that is about economics. Yeah. Uh, It's about family economic opportunity which creates, you know, communities, if they don't have economic opportunity, it creates communities in which crime, you know, increases. And so we know that we have economic opportunity here and we just need to make sure that it's available to all or we might see our community change. So we really want to make sure that economic opportunity is available to all. Absolutely. We have a lot of economic growth in this region, but we also have a lot of families who are struggling economically and children we have more than 20,000 kids in this region, Washington Benton counties, who live in poverty. And that's not even counting the kids who live near poverty. And so we want to make sure that they have the opportunity today, where 20 years down the road, we're still saying those great things about Northwest Arkansas. We're still talking about how, what a great place it is to live because we have an educated and engaged workforce and educated, engaged neighborhoods. That's what we want to make sure that we keep. Yeah, no, and as I'm thinking about this, it's it's that that age old idea of you know you it, it, no don't just give somebody a fish, teach them how mm-hmm, to fish, mm-hmm. and I and I think that this area is ripe for those types of opportunities. So so that's exciting. Sometimes if I'm like talking to the Rotary or something, I'll try right. to explain like why this work matters, and I'll say you know think about the show them a picture of a childhood of Springdale Head Start, right? You know have to live in poverty to 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 qualify to be in Head Start. Here are the kids in today's Springdale Head Start. 20 years from now to 25 years from now, if they live next door to you or they were coming in your business to get a job or what would you want for them? Would you want what would you want for them to the education that they would need to work for you or to live next door to you, the kind of engagement in the community you would want them to be your next door neighbor? So then rewind back to right now, what do we be, What do we need to be doing for those kids today to make sure they're the ones that, that are part of your community 25 years from now? And so it's tr- kind of just get people to vision, you know, what do we want for kids? And selfishly, what do we want for our own community and all of us? A- yeah. And that w- we'll get that if we make sure the kids have what they need. Yeah. I mean, foresight is everything. I mean, it really is. And, and it's not practice as much as I'd like to see it practice. But um, certainly in the five years that I've been here in Northwest Arkansas, it seems that that is a consideration that a lot of people have, a lot of organizations have. I've, you know, I've sat down with some really fabulous organizations comparable to yours, like Single Parent Scholarship Fund of Northwest Arkansas and just other organizations that are really doing some great, great things. And I think it's that kind of foresight that exists in organizations like yours and others that will will lead this state in a in a in a good way so that you know when you look at it and it's like you know people aren't saying well at least we aren't Mississippi or at least we aren't whatever cuz you know we we'll be at the top of the states around the country in terms of our ability to provide the needs that all of the citizens of this great state have. So, so yeah, you know, I mean, one of the best things we do is uh, in partnership with an organization called the Annie Casey Foundation that's based in Baltimore. We do something called the Kids Count Rankings and uh, kids, the Kids Count Data Book comes out every June and it ranks states in child well-being. And that there are all these different areas of child well-being that they rank everything from teen pregnancy and high school graduation to third grade reading levels, yeah. which I'm sure you know are super important in making Absolutely. sure a child succeeds. And so um, the Annie Casey Foundation and we put all this data together and we have every state and territory of the U.S. are all part of that ranking as well. And so we can see how we compare to other states. And uh, just and just in case you're interested, it we're 40 in 2019 on that uh, data book and we'll have new numbers come out in 2020. But um, we've actually improved um, oh, significantly good. over the last few years. You know, 40 is obviously nothing to be satisfied with or right. brag about, but it is, it does show some improvement in our state based, you know, in education and healthcare access. 
and other areas that I mentioned. But the best thing about that is that we can look at that. We can look at that number one state and, you know, which is kind of alternately sometimes Minnesota, sometimes um, New Hampshire, Vermont. And so we look at the, what the best states are in terms of child well-being. Right. And then we can look, OK, well, what are they doing on yeah. juvenile justice or what are they doing on access to early childhood education? And is it something that'll work in Arkansas? Not everything that they do in Minnesota or in New Hampshire is going to work in Arkansas, but some of the things will work and are pragmatic and are something that we can push for in our state. And so that's where we use those rankings, which is something that's really good. Like we we don't know how we're doing unless we measure. And so one of the most important aspects of our work is that measurement. No, I I absolutely. I agree. And, you know, it's funny. I mean, I'm I'm certainly going to date myself now, but I remember a program when I was growing up called RIF, Reading is Fundamental. Uh-huh. And um, I think LeVar Burton at the yeah. time was a big spokesperson <laughs> mm-hmm. for RIF, but that was a big deal back then. But it was constantly beat into our heads over and over again. I, I read at a high level from a very young age, and it's probably the reason why I talk so much and talk about so many different things. But I think more and more kids need to gravitate towards something like that. And it needs to be, it needs to be firmly planted in their minds that A, it's okay to read, it's cool to read. I make my kids read uh, before they get Xbox time because, you know, nowadays it's like kids, their quickest go to is, you know, getting put that, putting that headset on, getting on their iPhone or getting on an Xbox game or whatever and start, you know, playing. And that's great. But like I tell my kids, I just want you to be able to critically think, to be able to read anything. And with those two skills right there, you're pretty much okay. Because when you look at, the overall, where we're headed as a society, that is going to be one of the areas that fewer and fewer people are going to be able to master because of where things are now. And, and yes, we still have a, there is a yeoman's road for us to go down in order to overcome this. I think it's possible, but it, it starts with each of us trying to be really vocal about that. And so you guys are doing a great service to that issue. And I think each of us as individuals needs to do it. So, but I think we need that reminder. You know, 40 is nothing to be excited about. I think we need to get higher than 40. We need to get to 30 and then we need to, need to go to the 20. And mm-hmm. I mean, doggone it, in 10 years, maybe all the kids in Arkansas that are in third grade read at such a high level that, you know, we're off the map. And yeah, that's part of that's just a reminder that, it, that we can be that state. We don't have to be satisfied with where we are and we don't have to be satisfied with being doing better than some other Southern states. We want to do as well as any state. Yeah. And there was no shade thrown towards Mississippi. I just, (laughs) I just, you know, it's always the case because Arkansas sometimes is up there as well. But I mean, I think we need to be, we need to be, we need to want better for ourselves. 100% agreement. And actually one area where we're 50th that sometimes surprises people is we're 50th in teen pregnancy. And um, oh, and that is a policy. That is yeah. straight policy issue. Right. Uh, right. States, we are actually improving as a state, but in our teen pregnancy numbers. But other states that have better policy are improving faster than us. Yeah. That have really taken that issue on. And so, a good example. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about soup. Okay. Because uh, yeah, because I'm just really I you know again part of why I'm here is that. The folks from um, uh, Cityscapes had a great article about Soup Sunday, and this is in its fifth year or sixth year? 19th. 19th year. 19th. I'm sorry. I'm shortchanging no, it's, you. It's yeah, okay. well, five plus 14 right. is 19. Well, so it started really small, so it's hardly- it 19 years church. ago, it, it was- It started in a church in right. Fayetteville, right? Yeah, it was yeah. hardly what it is today, so uh, you can be forgiven, but- it's been big for five or six years, really big, but, uh, but it, yeah, it did start a long time ago, and actually- if you count our Little Rock office, which has Soup Sunday, their own Soup Sunday in February, this fundraiser is 39 years old. There's wow. just the 39th. Okay. Uh, it's one of the oldest fundraisers in the state. So um, is this your biggest fundraiser of the year? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. The Northwest Arkansas office is almost totally paid for through Soup Sunday. Okay. So it's our All biggest right. fundraiser that keeps our voice here in this part of the state. Well, we got to raise some money That's then right. for that. So <laughs> That's right. you guys had over 1,200 people attend last year. Mm-hmm. So that means the goal is that to actually each year you're growing and yeah. adding more and more. And with people like Chef Matt Cooper from The Preacher's Son, who's been on this podcast and others. There's going to be some really good soup there. So why don't you just give us just a quick commercial about this event? Sure. Again, it's the 26th of January from 4 to 6.30 p.m. at the John Q. Hammond Center 
in Rogers, That's which right. is basically connected to the embassy suite. Yeah, there. the convention center right yeah. there off the interstate. The best thing I can say about this event, I think, to convince people who haven't come before is that it's a lot of fun and that your whole family can come and it's really casual. So, you know, you think about a fundraiser that might be kind of fancy or that you have to dress up for. This is not that event. So you can come, you know, in the middle of the day, you're back home by 6, 6, 30, mm-hmm. 7, and you've experienced the whole event on a Sunday afternoon. And, and the food is incredible. The, you know, we will have 35 restaurants, all local, all providing great homemade soup made in their restaurants. Um, Everybody from you mentioned Preacher's Son. We have here in downtown Springdale, Spring Street Grill has actually been serving soup at Soup Sunday every year since we started. And Susan's Restaurant, which is a really home home style restaurant here in Springdale is part of this event. So it's the Hive, you know, at 21C. And the some of the restaurants, even the Holler is making soup. We mentioned the Holler earlier. So restaurants from Rope yeah, Swing Louise, Group. Yeah, Louise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, several of the of the Rope Swing groups. Louise at the Bentonville Airport sure, is sure. one of those. And then we have Vetro 1925 and yep. Hugo's yeah. in, in downtown Fayetteville. So we have uh, restaurants in all of our cities in the region. And uh, some of the places that people love to go to the most that may, are making local delicious food. And so they'll bring those soups, you know, in the in 10, 15 gallons of soup. And then what you do as a person who comes to the event is you you walk in and you just get as many samples as you want. It's served in little sample cups. Okay. And um, people actually bring their own muffin tins from home so they can hold all, as many soup cups as they can possibly <laughs> carry oh, my around. Goodness. That's and funny. so, yeah, the pro tip is it, it, you can tell people who've been before or who've read about it closely the, because they will show up literally from with their own muffin tin from home. And so, but if you don't have one, we give people little soup carriers that are like those little beverage containers right, that you right. get in the drive through. So people can get those. And um, we compost and recycle almost every single thing in the room. Okay. We don't even have garbage cans in the room. Does that mean you're working with Food Loops? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Another guest on the podcast. <laughs> right. So Excellent. Yeah. We started this probably 10 years ago, composting and recycling. And then once we heard about the service that Food Loops provides, we started partnering with them. Last year was our first year to partner with Food Loops. And this year they're helping us with that too. But we've been doing it for a long time, and uh, we try our best to create the least amount of waste that we can at this event, and uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, they were they worked at the Roots Festival, and I was blown away by the amount yeah. of waste that yeah. they were able to get rid of, and yeah. uh, just just phenomenal, phenomenal. So, all right, well, this is exciting. So, you guys, there are individual and corporate sponsorships are still available, mm-hmm. right? And then there's going to be a silent auction. What is it? What's what's part of the silent sure. auction? Sure, we um we, in the past we've had a silent and a live auction, and this year we're all putting it all in the silent auction, including vacations. I mean, so the silent auction will have everything from like a Keurig coffee maker and a Persian rug to a vacation in Costa Rica and another in Florida and another in Mexico and another in Hot Springs, and so uh, well, it's just a huge variety, and even including books and things that kids can bid just a few dollars on if they want to. So it's like a really big, wide variety right. of things in our auction. We have a band and the kids hilariously dance the whole time. And this year we're going to have a kids zone, which okay. we've never had before, which Mercy is sponsoring. Oh, nice, nice. And in that kids zone, not only will we have folks from Mercy entertaining kids and, you know, coloring and showing them some of the cool things about Mercy, but we also have the Arkansas Coalition of Marshallese, who we mentioned earlier, they'll be helping kids with some crafts that okay. are very, you know, culturally March Marshallese. So we're really excited about that. That'll be our first, this will be our first time to have the kids on. So we're oh, nice. super excited about that. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm excited. I, I plan to bring my kids, it's the, uh, what's Pro Bowl weekend and nobody watches the NFL Pro Bowl. So <laughs> that, that's okay. There's we always nothing, avoid the Super Bowl. Yeah, we, exactly. We didn't the Super Bowl, Bowl, yeah, so yeah, well, so it's <laughs> not that, not that big of a deal. You're not missing anything. Come on out. Really come out and support Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families. This is the 19th Annual Soup Sunday. There are several different ticket options available. There's a patron. What does a patron ticket do? Sure. Yeah, I've figured that people who are listening to this, the first thing they want to know is how much are tickets. So I should have mentioned that at the beginning. But 
Adult tickets are thirty five dollars. Right. Um, kids tickets are ten dollars, yeah. and that's just five to seventeen. So kids under five are free. Yeah. So you can come for like you know what you might spend at a fast casual kind of restaurant on a Sunday yeah. for your family. You can this can be your whole meal, lunch plus supper probably. But um, and then we have a patron ticket, which is just a ma- basically making an extra donation to advocates, but it also cl- includes a couple of adult beverages if you want those. Oh, um, so that's a sixty dollar ticket. Okay. And but then so but most people buy the adult tickets for thirty five unless they want to make that extra donation, which we of course appreciate. And then the sponsorships go from three hundred dollars for a family sponsorship all the way up to twenty five thousand dollars for a presenting sponsor. Oh wow! Our presenting sponsor this year is Endeavor Foundation. We're oh, very nice. grateful to okay. the support that they provide f- for our work in Northwest Arkansas. Well, yeah, well, and we'll have to give a big shout out for them. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the benefits of when you sponsor any type of event like this. Mm-hmm. People give you a shout out. Yes. So <laughs> yes. we will give a shout out for Good. to the Endeavor Foundation for that. And if anybody wants to get tickets, they can go to twenty twenty Soup Sunday NWA. That's all one word. 2020 soup Sunday NWA dot eventbrite.com. You can sign up for and get your tickets there. You can do your sponsorship there, all kinds of stuff there. And I know Chef Matt Cooper is going to be there again this year. Yes. So it'll be interesting to see. Does he do the same soup every year or does he no, do something he, different? He does something different every year. And he, uh, so we, one of the cool things we do is have what's called the Soup Sunday Best. Right competition. Yeah. And so as a... He's won t- it like two years in a he row. He did yeah. win it two years yeah. in a row. So people, if you go as a ticket holder, you can vote on, I can't remember, two or three soups. We give you tickets. You can either put them all in the same little mm-hmm. jar or you can disperse them around. People really take very seriously their voting <laughs> and yeah. who they vote for. But um, yes, Chef Matthew Cooper has won two years in a row. And so we'll see who brings their A game and wins this year. So he has serious soup baller status there. <laughs> right. at, I, and, and that's awesome. So, all right. Well, then... Count me in. Um, my family and I, we will be there. I hope Thank to see you. some of you guys listening to this episode there at the John Q. Hammonds uh, Convention Center, January 26, 2020, uh, from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. If it's after the event that they're listening to this episode, which is a good chance, are there any other events that you guys do throughout the year or how can people get in contact sure. with you if they want to help out? Sure. We do have a, a good number of events throughout the year. Um, Sometimes, like we'll have an event to talk about that Kids Count Data Book. We had sure. an event on the Bentonville Square to talk about that last year and really how people can get engaged. We'll be having some policy roundtables with the elections coming up. We've produced an election guide okay. that people can actually use to just ask, what are the questions you should ask your local lawmakers and others, p- other people running for office about kids? Is and that we, on your website? It is, and okay. it's aradvocates.org. And I was just going to tell people if they have any trouble finding Soup Sunday or finding us, just Google Arkansas Advocates. Right. And our web page will be what comes up. And you can there's a banner on there about Soup Sunday. So you and there's also an event page on there. So mm-hmm. if you're hearing about this, hearing this later, you can go onto that event page and see like what we have planned coming up in Northwest Arkansas and throughout the state. And you can also sign up on aradvocates.org for our emails and for even text alerts. We do even do text alerts to people who, you know, if your lawmaker, if you live in Centerton and your mm-hmm. lawmaker is on an important committee for a kids issue that's going to come up next week, we might even text you to say, hey, uh, let that person know that um, this is important to you because- That stuff matters. That's right. And they, you know, they get tired of hearing from us, you know, the of folks, course. us, but they do, ne- they never tire of hearing from their constituents. Const- absolutely not. And so we, um, so it's really important, you know, we'd, we'd love to see people at Soup Sunday, but we really would love for people to just get engaged in the work and, you know, take look at our emails, see what we send out or just go on our webpage. We have a plethora of information and data on kids and policy solutions that'll be great for the kids in yeah. Arkansas. And as I say, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So That's right. Definitely That's exactly speak right. up and, and help out those that need the help the most. So Laura Kellums, thank you so much. I got it. I'll be excited to tell your husband that I enjoyed this interview just as much as his <laughs> interview. And I appreciate all that you're doing with uh, Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families and Uh, so excited about this Soup Sunday. I really appreciate you moving things around in your schedule to meet with us and to join us because you you really are, you are Northwest Arkansas. And so we appreciate you sharing today. And we do look forward to checking back in with you in in the future to see how things are going. And if there's anything that we can ever do here at I Am Northwest Arkansas to help out, please never hesitate to ask. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there you have it, folks. Another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. 
It was so great to sit down with Laura. And I do seriously hope to see some of you guys at the Soup Sunday event on January 26th. I will be there with the whole family in tow. And um, I'm going to see if my 15-year-old can uh, outsuit me when it comes to all the different uh, soups that will be available. And one thing I will mention is that my understanding is that there will be a lot of different types of soups because I know some of you have uh, unique dietary uh, needs and ex- and um, some of you may have allergies to certain things. So there'll be a little bit of, there'll be a, a different types of soup for everyone that will be there. So I really want to encourage you to come out, take advantage of it and uh, find what you like and share it with those that are around you. So that's all we have for this week. We really appreciate you listening to I Am Northwest Arkansas, please remember, tell a friend. Sharing is caring. Let them know that you heard about this program or that you heard about something that was revelatory for you right here at IamNorthwestArkansas.com. Our episodes come out every Monday at noon. We'd love to hear from you if you have feedback, if you want to share some things with us. We've got some new sponsors coming up in in the coming weeks that we can't wait to share with you. There's a lot of great things happening here on, on the show. So We really appreciate you guys. We only exist because of you. And so we appreciate every everyone that listens. We appreciate the reviews. Thank you for checking us out and thank you for sharing it. That's all I have for right now. I will see you guys next week. Bye for now. We hope you enjoyed this episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. Check us out each and every week available anywhere that great podcasts can be found. For show notes or more information on becoming a guest, visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. We'll see you next week on I Am Northwest Arkansas.